Uh, and so I started to explore this list of 10 fetters. And unfortunately, there isn't a lot of information in the Buddhist tradition about what they are and what you're supposed to do with them. That's what I did. I figured out for myself anyway what they were. And as it turns out, as with the illusion of a separate self, the fetters all describe other illusions about ourselves that we have, something that we think is in here somewhere. The only place you've got is right here. And you don't have to create anything. You don't have to transform anything. You just have to see through some beliefs. And anyone can do it. Hello, Kevin. Hello, Lona. Nice to see you. Very nice to see you. And I've seen you around. And I'm so pleased to introduce you to, to the audience, to the Awakening Now podcast. Thank Here you. we go. Here's Kevin Shanilak. And he has been showing people 10 fetters a lot. Yes. <laughs> and I'm very curious about this. Because I'm not a Buddhist, and many of the people that are listening have no idea what are these 10 fetters. And sometimes I get people asking me, should I go there? Should I do this? I say, I don't know. <laughs> you see for yourself. I mean, are you a Buddhist? <laughs> so I would really like you um, to introduce us and speak in this about this from your experience and what it's about. But before we start, mm -hmm. The question is, what is your definition of awakening? So we are all on the same page. How do you define that? What is that? I would say today that it is realizing that what is happening right now, there's nothing wrong with it. Doesn't mean it's great, doesn't mean it's perfect, but there's nothing you have to do to be okay right now. Wow. So it's coming to this recognition. Yes. An understanding that many, many years ago, probably by the time you were two or three years old, you learned that things weren't all right. Or that's the assumption you were given. And so you created this identity to try to make everything okay. And then when you're an adult, or maybe before then, you realize, oh, well, maybe there isn't, for example, a separate self. And what the fetters do is they start with that, which I know you're very familiar with. Mm -hmm. And then you keep peeling away layers of assumptions and beliefs uh, until you get down to why it is you think that what's happening right now isn't okay, that there's something wrong. That's that's really good and practical. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, could mm -hmm. you tell us a little bit about how this awakening or how this recognition, realization showed up in your life? What happened? I can, yes. So it started, I was deep in meditation. I used to be quite the meditator. Mm -hmm. And I got to where my mind was very empty of thoughts, well, empty of everything, really. And I could have sat there for a long time. But then I had the idea, oh, well, if there is a self in here somewhere, I should be able to see it. There's nothing else happening. And so with that clarity of mind, I just looked for the self. And guess what? I didn't find one. And that's what started me on the path of the fetters. I didn't know what fetters exactly were. I had read of them, but I just knew they're this list of 10 things. Uh, so, well, one of the things I did is when I saw that there was no separate self, you had recently started the Liberation Unleashed website. And I went through there, you used to have something I forget what it's called. It's like the express lane, where if you thought you'd seen through the self, you could 
you could do that. And I did that and it was very mm-hmm. good to, to, you know, get some, not, uh, well, h- help me understand that, yeah, this is normal. This is good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Cause I really didn't have anyone else to talk to at the time. How long ago uh, was that? That was what, 12 years ago. Oh, wow. So just start Liberation Unleashed was just unleashed. <laughs> yes, it was just <laughs> unleashed. Yes. Yes. And then I said, okay. I, mean, I was a Buddhist at the time. Mm-hmm. I thought, okay, now what? Uh, and so I started to explore this list of 10 fetters. And unfortunately, there isn't a lot of information in the Buddhist tradition about what they are and what you're supposed to do with them. Oh, how interesting. Yeah. So over the course of the next three, three and a half years, that's what I did. I figured out for myself anyway, what they were. And as it turns out, as with the illusion of a separate self, the fetters all describe other illusions about ourselves that we have, something that we think is in here somewhere. So it, it was a very natural uh, transition from looking for and finding no separate self to eventually figuring out, oh, what am I looking for next? And that's mm-hmm. what the fetters give you is a list of things to look for. Mm-hmm. Spoiler alert, you're not going to find one. <laughs> but that's the whole point. I mean, right. you know, people know there's no separate self if they go on Liberation Unleashed, for example. Uh-huh. But even though they know what the right answer is, it's not that easy necessarily. So that's what the fetters give you is something to look for that you've created at some point that you believe in, uh, that you believe you need uh, to make everything okay right now. Mm. And could you just give us some examples from your like normal everyday life, from the ordinary life? What, okay. So, what you noticed that shifted or changed with this um, realization, with this fetter work and everything? Like how it used to be before and what it is, what it, what it looks like now? Okay. So the next thing after seeing through the separate self is the illusion that there's something about you that makes reacting ne- necessary. So I, I call they're technically called desire and ill will. It's the push and pull. You know, Mm -hmm. we pull at what we want and we push at what we don't want. And the belief is there's something in here somewhere. It might feel like a button gets pushed. Um, It it makes reacting necessary. It's like we we can't can't help ourselves. And I eventually realized that yes, I have this belief that it seems like there's a button in here somewhere that gets pushed by certain people in certain situations. And one day I was about to send a not so nice email to someone. And fortunately I pulled back from the keyboard and asked myself, well, why do I have to send this email? And I just closed my eyes and I looked for the reason I had to send that email. And I looked and looked, and of course I didn't find anything, but that was enough you know, that decisive not finding. Uh, It's just like looking for the separate self and not finding it. Uh, With this next step, it was realizing, oh, wow, there really is nothing about me that makes reacting like this necessary. Mm -hmm. And it was uh, an instantaneous uh, change. Suddenly, I was much less reactive. Uh, what it's what's called weakening these fetters first they are so strong our reactive illusions they're so strong that first you weaken them and then you break them Mm -hmm. Uh, so weakening means that i was much slower to get reactive to get angry to get excited Uh, that level of anger or frustration or whatever reached a much lower level and then it quickly went away so instead of you know being angry for a good part of a day, it was a good part of a minute. Yeah, that's a big change. <laughs> that is a big change. Yeah, and then a few weeks later, 
uh, I went in and did some very intensive looking this, of the same type mm -hmm. uh, and eventually broke those fetters of desire and ill will, that, that urge or the need to react. Mm -hmm. uh, and one of the big things that comes from breaking those fetters is suddenly uh, all sense of fear is gone. Oh, wow. It's like you, you don't think you have to do anything, you know, to react, mm -hmm. to protect yourself. Mm -hmm. um, and it was really, you know, about a week after that, I was in our car driving and a big truck almost hit us. And I was really quite surprised that there was no fear. I just, I saw the truck coming and, well, either he's going to stop or he's not. Well, fortunately, mm -hmm. he stopped. Mm -hmm. uh, but all sense of the push and pull at what's happening at life, you know, at people, at situations, uh, that was gone. And uh, I could see clearly why the fear was gone as well. I, I wasn't worried about what was going on around me. It doesn't mean I was unconcerned. You know, I still cared about the people and things around me but the perceived need to react was gone. Hmm. So would you say that a push and pull and the fear, it kind of comes together? Yes. Is it part of, part of the same gift? Part yeah, same, same package. package. Yeah, yes. I see. Yeah, because there is there is a beingness, noticing what is happening. There is what is happening, all these experiences. And then it seems like there is someone or something in the middle. <laughs> Right. Pushing and pulling that which is happening. Right. And even if you see through the sense of a separate self, so you don't mm -hmm. think anyone is doing the push and pull, mm -hmm. the push and pull is still there. Exactly. Yeah. And it's that push and pull that made the illusion of a separate self all the more convincing. All right. And it's all about fear. That push and pull is because of fear of what may happen, what will happen, need to control. Yeah. One. What? That, that's one way of putting it. Yeah, if I don't react, then what? Uh -huh. If I don't react, then what? That's a great question. Yeah, if I don't react, right. then what? Uh -huh. Right. And so what it allows is the ability to just respond in a much more, you know, usually productive way. Hmm. It doesn't mean I'm indifferent or you don't care. It's that you don't bring that reactivity to the situation. Yes. And as you say, it's easier said than done. So would you say that one needs to have their mind already quite quiet to be able to notice when that reactivity first arises? Or can it be done like in a retrospective looking back? Um, actually, it's very difficult to do in the moment. The way I suggest doing it is picking something that you got angry at yesterday. And in working with that, uh, but you don't need to be in any sort of meditative state. Um, many people just can't meditate or are not interested in meditation, and that's fine. Uh, I was not in a meditative state when I worked with these fetters. Um, it was basically an everyday experience, level of experience. Wonderful. So that would be the. Second fetter or the third, second fetter, right? Well, the way the fetters are grouped, uh, I think it's because they needed 10. Uh -huh. There's actually only seven shifts. So uh -huh. fetters one, two, and three are grouped together. Uh -huh. And that has to do with the separate self. And then fetters four and five are desire and ill will. So that's the push and the pull. Ah, okay. Okay. So, so after that, it's, it's one shift per fetter. Uh-huh. Okay, so how can we work with desire and ill will? What are the what are the main beliefs here? Uh, so the the way I suggest working with it is again just pick something that you know you will react to, have reacted to, and and bring that to mind. And to kind of soften it, I suggest um, instead of saying you know for example. Uh, your neighbor said that your yard is a mess <laughs> and you got angry. 
um, mm -hmm. turn that around and say, well, my neighbor didn't say my yard was fine. You know, you know, phrase in terms of what you want that you didn't get. And that, that can bring the reactivity down. Mm -hmm. uh, and then just dropping that fact in that they didn't say that your yard looks fine. Um, you know, you'll start to feel some reaction coming up. Mm -hmm. And then you can look for uh, the reason to react mm -hmm. within that that sense of just starting to react. There can be a gap between dropping in that fact and actually reacting. If you can get into that gap, uh, that's the place to look around saying, well, is there anything connecting, you know, what the fact is and this reaction that wants to, to start up. Uh, so I, I have guides for all of the fetters on my website at simplyascene.com uh, that walks you through step by step how to go about it. Oh, wonderful. I'll put that in the description. Okay. okay. So the desire and ill will, can we talk a little bit more about that? Like, okay, sure. desire is something that you suddenly feel an impulse. Let's say I want a new car. Why want a new, I want a ice cream. Oh. Is that yeah. what we're or talking chocolate. about? Oh, chocolate. Yeah, so just anything that um, that makes you start to pull. Uh-huh, to go towards um, something. Usually, right. And then the push, which is usually what is worked with uh, in, in working with the fetter, that's when you, you don't want something. You know, you don't like what your neighbor said. Um, mm -hmm. You don't like what happened to you when you were 10 years old. Uh, you don't like what's happening uh, in the political world right now. Mm -hmm. It could be anything. Mm. And this word ill will, can it be translated into more like everyday language? Uh, aversion. Aversion. Uh, it might go so far as hatred or, um, you know, it's, it's usually pretty strong. You know, it's something that makes you react. Uh, and in Buddhist terms, it it causes you to suffer. Uh, yeah. It's, you know, it gives sense that sense of anguish and pain uh, at just, you know, learning, you know, or just listening to your neighbor talk or just bringing to mind an hour later what they said. Mm -hmm. uh, it's painful. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah, so uh, it's uh, th there's usually no shortage of things to work with. <laughs> uh, Even for the, you? The key, well, I don't have much to work with anymore, but usually, you know, uh, if you're working on these fetters, you'll have a range of reactivity. You know, there'll be some things that, you know, you don't like it, but you don't really get that reactive to it. And there are some things that are just too strong that you probably aren't able to work with. Mm -hmm. So picking something kind of in the middle, you can start to get a sense of what that gap between, you know, the unpleasant fact and your uh, growing reaction to it. You can, you can see that gap kind of open up and it's like, oh yeah, I can be here. It's not pleasant. You know, it feels like, oh, I should be reacting right now. Uh, but you can see that, oh, well, maybe I don't have to react right now. You know, maybe I can take 15 seconds before I react. And usually, you know, that can be a very good, um, you know, victory. Of re you know, just starting to realize, oh, maybe I don't have to react. Uh, yeah, like what's then, wrong with unpleasant? Yeah. Uh, and then from there you can start to really get a sense of, okay, what does it seem like is in here somewhere uh -huh. that is that makes reacting necessary? Why do I have to react? And, uh, you know, it can help to look for something uh, like, if it feels like a button is getting pushed, you know, your neighbor button got pushed, look for that button. Mm -hmm. uh, if it feels like a, uh, a trigger got pulled of some sort, look for the trigger. 
In my case, it was more general. I was just looking for the reason why I had to react. I was looking for that reason. Um, so it's a little different from looking for a separate self because you're looking for one thing and you know what it is. It's already got a name, mm -hmm. your name. <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. Whereas with the desire and the will, it can seem to be you know, a variety of things. It's a little bit more customized to what it seems to be to you. And can I ask you, how long does it normally take? Because some people may expect, oh, you know, I see it once, that's it. I see it for a month, that's it, or for a year. How long? Like working on one pet and your experience, like what's the time? The, it really <laughs> does vary. It's like looking through the separate self. I mean, some people, you know, in a matter of days or a couple of weeks, it's over. Other people might be months. Some people just never are able to see it clearly enough. Huh. Can they get stuck on that? Yes, definitely. It, people can get stuck on it. Right. Uh, it, it. It's very helpful to have a guide, just as it is on Liberation Unleashed. Uh, but it's also something you can do by yourself. Hey, let's move to the next one, please. Okay. Yeah. So uh, the next one uh, is Fetter 6. It is uh, usually called form, but it's the illusion that the form you take is as the subject. So you're the subject, everything else is an object. So it's that sense of being separate from everything mm -hmm. and you being the center of attention. Um, and the illusion is that there's something about you that makes you the subject. You know, it's, and what you find if you start looking at what's happening in experience is that you'll go out and you know, you'll see something and then you'll come back in here and evaluate it. What is it? How do I feel about it? You know, what should I do about it? And then you'll go out and get some more information, come back in. So it's this regular shuttling back and forth that I eventually caught myself doing and realizing, oh, wow, I do that all the time. The illusion is that when we come back in or what it feels like coming back in uh, to evaluate what's going on, that all this information is coming to a certain part of us that we assume is makes us the subject. Um, you know, it's one analogy would be that, you know, if you were in a play and there's 20 people on stage, you're always the leading actor or actress. Mm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, and, you know, ju and just spatially, it can seem like, you know, all information funnels in towards me. Um, you know, we have a very fixed sense of, of space and, you know, just, just turning your head back and forth. Uh, if this fetter is in place, it'll, it seems like, you know, you know, visual information is all funneling your way. Um, so what working with this fetter uh, involves is watching how you take in information and where it seems to go and how you continually create this sense of being the subject in life. And mm -hmm. everything else is an object. Everything is in relationship to you. You know, it doesn't matter that everyone else is doing this too. It says, well, but I'm the most important person on stage here. Mm -hmm. um, and what you're looking for is this, this receptor, this point, uh, wherever you, it seems information is going, it's often uh, felt to be on the sternum, on the front, uh, for some reason. Um, but of course, if you look for something like that, there's nothing there. And when this fetter shifts, that sense of being the central person, the central thing in life falls away, as does the sense of there being uh, definite boundaries 
in, in especially your own boundary, you know, boundaries start to soften and you become much less self-referential. Like inwardly um, or outwardly? Um, well, just, ex I guess, experientially. Um, another thing that happens is how everything appears visually uh, can mm -hmm. seem to be very two-dimensional. Two it's like that artificial, artificial sense of depth uh, goes away. You can still drive a car. I mean, you still have, you know, some depth perception. But what you realize is that you've separated yourself from everything else. And so, uh, and, and said, I'm the most important central, you know, actor here. Uh, that sense goes away. It's very interesting here because, you know, this seeing that there is no separate self, isn't that kind of the same thing? Maybe it's a little bit different flavor. Yeah. Because yeah. for me, like yeah. saying that there is no separate self, it, in my expression, is everything is showing up on its own by itself. There is nobody here doing it, receiving it thinking it, making it happen, controlling it. Mm -hmm. right. And yet that, everything that's... is appearing on its own. And right, yeah. Including yeah. that sense of separate self, including that apparent center. Hmm. Right. So the way the, the fetters work is, uh, we'll get to the eighth fetter, that's the sense of huh? I am. I see. Okay. <laughs> uh, um, and on top of I am, you build the sense of somethingness, you know, solidity, um, you know, that there's actual somethings in the world. And then on top of that, you build the sixth fetter, which is form. Well, the form I take is that of subject. I'm not just anything. Mm -hmm. I'm the thing. And then once you have that perspective, then you move on to, well, if I'm the thing, then I'm I uh, I should be able to push and pull at everything, because it matters what I what I think, mm -hmm. and with all this pushing and pulling, there has to be a separate self that's the agent, the controller, the experiencer. So mm -hmm. it um, so in the first fetter, there's that sense of separate self, and then all the way underneath is the eighth fetter of that that fundamental sense. Well, I am, I exist. Um, so, uh, it's, it's kind of a, a combination of what you just described, um, you know, that, or maybe better to say that I think what you described is, um, kind of encompasses all of the first eight fetters in, in some way. You know, there's there's experience of um, you know no cent no centrality at all, no boundaries. You know, things are just happening. Um, in the fetters approach, typically, uh, when the sense of a separate self goes away, that's all that goes away. You don't have that sense of there not not being any any center, any boundaries yet. You take it step by step. Ah, yeah. So it, it, perhaps it's very helpful to be able to put in words what the experience is in particular time. Just like like mapping, a little bit like mapping. Yeah, it, but I understand yeah, it doesn't have to be one, two, three, four in a sequential way. It can be anyway. Right. I. It, it can you don't have to go in a linear way like the fetters describe. I think mm -hmm. what the fetters describe though is that in one way or another, in whatever order, these are the things that disappear. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. You know, your your reactivity disappears, your sense of a separate self disappears, uh, your sense of being the subject uh, to all these objects disappear, and so forth. So yep. it, it takes it a st step at a time and it's very definite. Wonderful. And here comes the question, what about emotions? Okay, because there are people, they are feeling sadness for months or feeling dread of life or insecurity or guilt or shame. 
do these disappear with some particular fetter? Is that connected to some particular belief? Um, usually those can hang on until the end, until nine and 10. Uh, so maybe we should move on. <laughs> okay. Uh, so after six, if, if you no longer have the sense of being the subject, the most important thing happening, you still feel like you're a something. You still feel, still feels like you have a body. It still feels like you have a mind. And it seems like everything around you, you know, exists in time and space. Everything's something. Mm -hmm. Even if you tell yourself, well, you know, for example, things are impermanent. They can't be, you know, what, you know, what I think they are. But your experience of everything, including yourself, is as a something. Um, so, and the illusion here is that there is a part of you that is able to perceive some things. There's a part of you that recognizes, oh, that's, you know, this is, this is a glass. Well, in conventional language, it is a glass. Mm -hmm. And there's water in it. But the experience of it being an absolutely, you know, existing thing, you know, everything being separate, uh, especially you, you know, I, I have a mind, I have a body, I'm, I'm still a person. Hmm, how interesting. I'm listening yeah, to and you and it's like, the, the way I see things is, is different than what you are describing and it's like how can i connect that to my experience <laughs> i'm not right, so well, sure what's going on with these feathers <laughs> right well uh -huh. right well this so what the after you the seventh fetter shifts and you realize oh i'm not actually perceiving actual somethings then it's probably what, what sounds like is more like you are experiencing things where things don't seem separate absolutely separate and existing. There isn't a sense of a mind or a body. Um, mm. You lose all sense of space and of time. Interesting. Um, yeah, so uh, in another way of describing it, it, the way you experience things becomes almost completely non-dual. Uh, there's still a sense of I am or I exist. There is mm -hmm. a, a subtle duality happening. But in everyday life, um, you know, things don't seem <laughs> as they were. They they seem more like, you know, images. And like I'll, a dream like, seem like yeah, or flowing you're, you're experience watching. after experience, just the experience that is here in this moment we are talking. That's it. Yeah. yeah. Or uh, another analogy is if you're watching a movie and it seems, you know, fairly real what's happening uh, on the screen. And then the house lights come up and you realize, oh, no, that's just images on a screen. That's one way of describing what happens when the seventh fetter goes away. It's like, oh, I don't have this, what you might call a transparent experience of all these solid and real things, including me. You know, what I thought was my body or I thought was my mind wasn't an actual something. It's... You know, the version I had in my mind was solid and real, but in actuality, what I'm experiencing is not that. Uh, so that can be a very significant shift. Um, the, in psychological terms, if you're familiar with depersonalization and derealization. This, can, you, can you tell us, please? Uh, well, it's a clinical diagnosis where usually because of trauma or mm -hmm. some other cause people stop seeing themselves as real and stop seeing everything else as real so depersonalization derealization and it can and if it just comes on all of a sudden it can be very frightening um because for whatever reason they just stop interpreting information that way uh, during the awakening process, it's a much more gradual uh, change, and it's very intentional. So when 
when you lose the sense of everything being absolutely real and existing in time and space, um, it's it's very interesting, but it's um, you know, it's not scary. Okay, here I want to ask something to clarify. This word "real," mm -hmm. real. Mm -hmm. What is your definition of real? Um, existing. Uh, something independent about it, maybe. Um, something with definite boundaries. Like, for example, if I if I look at this cup, and mm -hmm. right now, yes, there are sensations. Okay, there is warmth, smoothness. There are sensations, right? And this whole experience, mm -hmm. visual, sound, touch, we call. Mm -hmm. I call it's reality of the moment. Like it is here, it's not imagined. But right. the way it exists in a in an absolute sense, it's sensation. There is no cup here. There are all kinds of sensations with different names and different parts. And there is right. nothing there. Yes. Yeah. So the difference I would, would make is that. Uh, when the seventh fetter goes away, you realize that your version of the cup is an interpretation of sense data. So your, your touch, your, your, you, you see it, you smell it, and, and so forth. Um, you realize that you're living in a mental simulation. Huh. Doesn't mean you can't grab a blue glass and have some water. Cheers. <laughs> Cheers. But you realize that, oh, uh, everything isn't, a, uh, there's a, an author called Anil Seth uh, who wrote a book called Being You, and he's a neuroscientist. And what he determined was that we come to believe that we have what he calls a transparent experience of everything. We don't think that our experience is actually, you know, goes through our senses. We think you know, when we hold up a cup, that um, we are experiencing the cup itself, not our mental interpretation of it. Ah, yeah, that's a big difference. Yeah. Yeah. So, and of course, the big thing when the seventh fetter shifts is that your sense of having a mind and body fall away. You still have a sense of inside and outside, but... Um, you know, the boundaries are really getting thin, shall we say. So when you say having a body, like there, there, is this the sense of ownership of sensations that falls away? Or are these sensations mm -hmm. falling away? No, the sensations are there, but they're not you know, integrated into an actual thing called a body any longer. Right. You still remember what a body is if you go to the doctor <laughs> and you say, my name <laughs> You can point to your knee, uh -huh. but um, yeah, it's like when you go through the gateless gate, you can still use first person pronouns. Mm -hmm. You don't, you don't forget how to use them, but the word, you know, self or your name no longer seems to point to anything or anyone in particular. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think it's more or less the same thing here is that whatever is happening, you know, my knee, uh, for example, I, I remember what a knee is, but the experience of it being, you know, real and existing uh, has gone. Mm, interesting. Yeah. Uh, so after the seventh fetter falls, then what's left is, for the eighth is this sense of I am. Uh, I am is, goes, you know, has been looked at for millennia, really. Uh, it is the focus of Advaita non-dual practice. Um, it's in the Jewish tradition, and it's obviously in the Buddhist tradition as well. Uh, one thing about the Buddhist tradition says that the, the sense of I am is not actually true. It's not real. That itself is an illusion. Uh, that's this sense of there being an inside and an outside. 
or this sense of, well, I am awareness, I am consciousness, I am everything and everything is me. Uh, can seem very convincing, but uh, that too turns out to be an illusion. And the illusion is that, um, you know, it can seem like there's something called awareness or consciousness that is, you know, just saying, oh, this is, this is a blue glass, for example. Uh, there must be awareness or consciousness that is, you know, something called that, that makes that recognition possible. You know, I can differentiate between a glass and the mm -hmm. plant behind me. Mm -hmm. uh, and that sense of awareness or consciousness, we don't just identify with it, we identify as it. You know, I am awareness, I am consciousness. Uh, and so the... Uh, the inquiry is to look at, okay, is there something called awareness or consciousness? And more specifically, is there something that, that makes these differentiations uh, between a, you know, a doorway and a wall? It's a really handy differentiation to make if you want to get out of a room. But you know, is, you know, do these differentiations just happen or is there something called you know, awareness or consciousness or a differentiation thing uh, that makes that happen. Because that's what you identify as, this, this underlying sense of awareness, aliveness, beingness, consciousness. But if you see that there's nothing that you're actually identifying as, uh, that illusion goes away and suddenly you know, even the the fundamental I am, uh, it, you know, those are two words that don't make any sense anymore. It's just like, you know, when your name doesn't make any sense when you go through the gate. Uh, and when the eighth fetter falls, that's when the sense of inside and outside falls away. Um, and a health warning, uh, <laughs> when, when you lose all sense of identity, so uh, what also goes away is uh, what your identity did for you. And that was in large part to manage trauma. So uh -huh. once the eighth fetter shifts, trauma can just come out because there's no longer an identity to manage it, to control it, to integrate it. Uh, so some people go through that. Most I think don't, but some do. Uh, so that's one thing to watch out for. But the good news is that as far as I know, everyone goes, gets through it after a few days, maybe, you know, two, three weeks or something like that. Um, and then it's on to the ninth fetter. Uh -huh. And what is and the ninth? The, and the ninth fetter is, uh, it's called restlessness. And here you're finally getting down to the sense of, oh, it seems like there's something wrong. It seems like I should feel better. It seems like I should know more than I do. It seems like there should be more certainty or reliability and predictability in the world. Um, it's the reason you created an identity in the first place. Your identity was a way of, you know, trying to cope with life, I guess you might say. It's so interesting that it stays through all of these other falling away to almost the last one, this wrestling. That's yeah, what's so next. This... What I need to do, what, something is wrong. I need to fix this. Right. Interesting that and... it doesn't fall away somewhere in, in between. <laughs> it's just no, it's... staying here. And... Wow. Yeah, and it's here you really find out what suffering is about. I mean, you mm. might think, oh, you know, if you stop pushing and pulling, you know, you know, suffering should stop. It's like, well, most of it does. But this very, what you might call existential suffering, uh, you know, that underlying sense that, you know, something's not right. I need to do something about it. The thing is, though, if the first eight fetters are gone, you don't have anyone or anything left to do anything with. You're just left with this restlessness. Right, right, right. Mm -hmm. Um, so then the ninth fetter is just about allowing that restlessness to, to settle down. Doesn't mean you're, you're fine with life, 
but you're no longer you know actively resistance resisting it you, know, you might have the sense of it's like okay fine you know <laughs> life isn't reliable and predictable i'm not crazy about it but i'm not going to fight you about it either um and that opens the door to the tenth fetter which is um what's usually translated as not knowing or ignorance mm -hmm. I think we know what's going on in life or what should go on in life we think we mm -hmm. should know exactly what everything is we should be able to predict things uh, we should feel good all the time and what the tenth fetter is about is realizing oh that's not right it's never been correct you know it's it's just not available um so if you you know in my case i was looking for reliability and predictability in my life right and of course it you know i never actually got it but i always thought it was possible uh i thought it was available somewhere i just had to learn enough think enough um, eventually i would figure it out or so i thought and the 10th fetter for me was fully accepting the fact, oh, reliability and predictability just aren't available. It's not like they're out there somewhere and you're missing them. It's just, that's not the way life works, really. Um, you know, and it's something I had told myself or been told, you know, probably a million times. Oh, there's no such thing as reliability and predictability. But it was then, uh, when the 10th fetter shifted, that I fully got it. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, okay. Why didn't you tell me this before? You know, it's like, well, yeah, we've been telling you all your life. But, um, you know, it's, and that is when the sense that something is wrong finally goes away. Interesting. That is when, that is when the, there's this, it's very surprising, or can be very surprising. There's this definite feeling of, wow, the spiritual path is over. It's like you hit a dead end. Because if suffering stops and nothing seems wrong, then, well, what else are you going to do? So from a spiritual perspective, that's it. You know, and there's, there's no fireworks. There's no ascending, you know, up into the sky or anything like it's just oh wow what's happening right now there's nothing wrong with it it may not be great but i don't have to there's nothing i need to do about it um, mm. and so in my case i was walking to work when it finally sunk in and i stopped for a moment and i actually laughed <laughs> and then i just kept walking to work um and, but it was a very definite change. Um, you know, the sense of being, you know, hitting a dead end. You know, I'd been on a spiritual path, you might say, for 20, 30 years. So it was odd to not feel like, you know, oh, there's something more I need to do now. Uh, so, you know, that in a, you know, 45 minutes is, you know, getting from uh, wherever you start to that sense of, wow, there's actually nothing inherently wrong with what's happening right now. It doesn't mean I'm indifferent. It doesn't mean that, you know, I'm not going to try to make changes in my life or, um, you know, I, I'm not a doormat to the world, as you might say. Uh, but as... You know, as you go through life and uh, and experience things, experience people, uh, yeah, that sense of oh, there's something wrong here is not there anymore, and so suffering goes away. Mm -hmm. um, hmm. Very interesting. Yeah, I mostly when I meet people, I I, I work with wherever they are coming coming from, but mostly mm -hmm. it's this. Yeah, there's you know feeling bad or feeling uncomfortable, it's fine. I mean, it's not here to be liked. It's here to be felt. Or, 
or you know yeah, working and, through all these uh, emotional things that are coming up and learning to meet them as they're coming up and so seeing them self-release because you know we're not doing it but our attention is allowing the the, the knots or the contractions to open up and all kind of stuff mm-hmm. yeah not i don't work so much with or oh, how things are. <laughs> mm-hmm. So I would say when you talked, I recognize all these fetters and my way to putting it or my way to seeing it or guiding through it. Not in mm-hmm. this language, in a different language. But I see the value of having this map and having a guide to go step by step, not necessarily in this way. It can be whatever way, whichever is coming up uniquely. But yeah, it's really interesting, you know, having having all these maps for clearing up remaining delusions, illusions and assumptions. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And then what's left after mm-hmm. that is, you know, you know, is all of your your conditioning and your habits, your ways of responding. They change, but they don't completely transform. Um, the good news is that if there's some really deep trauma that has influenced your entire life, um, it's much more accessible now and can be worked through. Uh-huh. That's good news, yeah. Um, or just, you know, as I would describe it, just ways of being in the world that were, were geared towards serving a, a self. Um, just don't work very well. And they're not, of course, they're not needed any longer, but you've, you've got this library of responses that that is kind of still there. So once, you know, a spiritual awakening occurs, then you can get on to, okay, how can I live life, you know, as well as possible uh, around other people, around other situations? Uh, it's not part of the spiritual path, but I think it's part of just a very practical and realistic, you know, how, how can I live today uh, in the best possible way? And with all of those fetters out of the way, uh, the possibilities really open up. Mm-hmm. Beautiful. And at this point, I want to ask you, what would be your the your best advice for somebody who's still seeking, still trying, still reading, watching videos, and going crazy trying to find this magical place of everything's okay? What's your best advice for that? Um, the only place you've got is right here. And you don't have to create anything. You don't have to transform anything. You just have to see through some beliefs. And anyone can do it. You don't have to be a meditator. You don't have to be a philosopher. You know, just like seeing through the sense of a separate self, you just have to be able to you know, differentiate between what you're thinking and what you're actually experiencing. Mm, wonderful sounds simple <laughs> well it can be but you know as uh as you know not everyone finds it that easy uh but it's yeah and, and the thing about the fetters is that it's from the buddhist tradition but it's very much a human thing mm-hmm. you know as you said you recognize the various aspects of it uh, what the Buddhist tradition did was to make a system out of it. And uh, that way you know, it can be written about and, and other people can try it. And that's what I've tried to do. Sometimes it's the most difficult thing is to to read what other people have to say and to find that in your own experience, because that can be put in so many different languages and so many different frameworks. Uh, and it's, it's difficult to translate the words that somebody says 
to your own experience. And this is, I think, that needs to happen for everyone. If you want to understand fetters, you have to connect to what is what is here for you, how you see it. And it may be a different language. Right. But and it's the still the, the same thing. Yeah, the unfettering approach definitely isn't for everyone. Uh -huh. um, there's other ways to do it. Um, I've talked to some people who it just kind of happened. They didn't. Uh -huh. They weren't on a path. They weren't working with a map, and yet these sorts of illusions just started to fall away on their own almost. So this, this is what we're all able to do. It's just finding the way that works. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Kevin. And how Thank can people you. find you through your website or Yeah, my Facebook? website is simply this. No, I just have a website at this uh -huh. point. I have a I work full time, so I don't have uh I'm not able to be in correspondence with people, but um simply the scene dot com uh has a, a lot of information that I hope is useful. Exactly. Wonderful. Well, it was such a pleasure to have you here and to open up this mysterious fetters thing. Now I have much better understanding what's going on there. And if people are going to ask me, do I need to do it? I say, yes, go and see your website and decide for yourself. But, you know, watch this video and see, it explains a lot. Okay, great. It was so good to finally meet you. Same here. Same here. Thank you so much. And thank you everyone for listening and watching. And I'll, I'll see you next time. Bye for now.